Carlos, this is why I said you better finish eating. Okay. Okay. Hearing come back to order, we now recognize the Chairman Emeritus, Mr. Burton, for his round of questioning. That means the old guy. Uh, well, that too. <laughs> well, first of all, uh, I want to start off by saying that uh, uh, the ATF, the FBI, CIA, all of our intelligence agencies, we have high regard for all of you, and uh, I know some of my colleagues indicated today that we were beating you over the head. We are not. We are investigating this issue, and we are certainly not investigating the good work that you guys do. And I know some of, you have been, some of your colleagues have been killed, some of you have been injured. We know you lay your lives on the lines for us, and so you have uh, our respect and admiration for what you do. Now, let me just say to Mr. McMahon and Mr. Newell, you, you, you know that you are under oath. Absolutely, sir. Okay. Both of you know that. Okay. What I want to know is, do you know who was involved in the decision-making process to start this whole program? Uh, again, I think this was not a program. This was a criminal investigation. Well, okay, this criminal investigation. Do you know who suggested or started this criminal investigation? The agents on the street are the ones that will initiate the investigation. Well, no, but who, someone said, this is what we are going to do. Who, who started it? Where did you get the instructions to do this? Well, we don't give our agents instructions to do things. They, they go out and produce cases on their own. So, so what you are telling me now is that uh, this, organi this, uh, this investigation that we are talking about, uh, what is the name of it again? What is it called? Fast and, Fast and, Furious. Fast and Furious, the one with Fast and Furious. This just uh, came from an agent in the field, and that was it. Uh, nobody else had anything to do with it. You didn't get a letter of instruction or anything like that? Absolutely not. The case. Well, what, what about this? You say you got a memo. There was a memo from a deputy attorney general about this. What was that? Well, I believe that Bill Newell was referencing a memo that the deputy attorney general put out regarding our strategy on how we are going to combat yeah, who firearms. Was the, who was the deputy attorney general? Uh, I believe that one came from Deputy Attorney General Ogden. It had Deputy Attorney Fast General Ogden. It had nothing to do when with did that come? It had nothing to do with Fast and Furious. What did it have to do uh, with? It had to do with the, the government's strategy to help combat the, the violence that is going on in Mexico. Did it have anything to do with the weapons that, that were going down there? Absolutely. There was a, there was okay, so I, it did have something to do with what we are talking about? Yes, it did. Okay. And his name is what? I believe it was uh, David Ogden, but I'm, I could not. I'm not okay. Positive. Now you also said earlier in testimony that there were a number of other agencies that were involved in this whole investigation process. You mentioned IRS, Customs, DEA, FBI, and so forth. You remember that? Again, I think. What I'm, were the names of the people that were involved in that? Again, I think Bill Newell answered those questions regarding this operation. This case being well, I conducted need to, well, out of What I want is the names of the people that were involved in the investigation from each agency. I don't know, I don't know well, the names. You, of each. Somebody does. Do you know Mr. Newell? I know a couple of the names. Yes, sir, I know the names. Okay. Yeah. We want those names. And the reason why we want those names is I am going to ask the chairman to talk to them about the continuing this investigation to find out how involved everybody was and why it went on as long as it did when we knew in 2009 that this kind of thing was going on. And if there were IRS agents, FBI agents, DEA agents, Customs or others, we want to know who was involved so we can question them as well. So I want their names. Do you have any of their names right now? No, sir, I don't. I'd have to get And you that. don't remember any of their names? I remember one of the names. Okay. Remember. What's his name? I believe that the ICE agent assigned to the case was a young man by the name of Lane France. Langford? Uh, Lane France. Lane French? Is that right? France, sir. Okay, you got that. How about the other agencies? Do you remember any of the names? Were there other people involved? Yes, sir, but I don't know their names, sir. Do you, can you find their names for us? Yes, sir. Okay, can you get those names for us? Absolutely, sir. Okay, will you get those names for us? Absolutely. Okay, and, and, and every single one of those names from those various agencies that were involved in the whole, uh, whole thing, we would like to have their names and their titles and the agencies they work for. Okay, yes, sir. And you will get this for us? I will do my best, yes, sir. No, 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 no. I don't want you to do your best. I'll I want it, the yes. names. Can you get us the names? Yes, sir, I will. And you do, know that you, you do know who they are and you know how to get their names? I will find out who they are and I will get their names, yes, sir. Okay. Would the gentleman yield? I will be happy to yield the microphone. Would you also include the dates 
that they were read into this program with sufficient specificity that they would understand the details of how the gun following that you say is not gun walking occurred? In other words, we don't want to just have names of people on lists. We want to have the names of people who were read into the program. And the dates that they were involved. Well, yes, sir. And if I can clarify a point, sir? Well, before you go clarifying, I want to make sure I get all this, yes. Mr. Chairman. I want to make absolutely sure we have their names, dates, times, places that they were involved in this investigation so that we can trace it all the way back to its origin and see where we went, see who was involved and, and how all these weapons, 2,000 weapons, got down in there uh, into uh, Mexico, and uh, uh, whether or not somebody up higher up uh, in the uh, Justice Department or the food chain might have been involved. And the only way we can get that information is from you two or the other people who are involved in the investigation from these other agencies. So I just want to say one more time. This is very important that you understand that you are telling us right now that you will get us this information. You can get us the names, times, dates, and places that we need. Yes, and you will do that? Yes, sir. Okay. Very good. I just want to make sure that you are under oath and you understand that. I yield to the Chairman. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Cleveland, Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Noel. On June 15, 2011, three agents under your command testified before this committee, and they outlined the very serious allegations that prompted this investigation. The line agents told us that as part of Operation Fast and Furious, one, they were instructed to cut off surveillance of suspected straw purchasers, two, they were ordered to forego arrests of straw purchasers, and three, they were prohibited from seizing or interdicting weapons from straw purchasers on several occasions when they believed they had the lawful authority to do so. Uh, Mr. Newell, you know, these are very serious allegations. But in your transcribed interview with the committee, you said you never heard these complaints before they became public in February of this year. Is that right? Yes, sir. Well, here is what you said. You said, to the best of my recollection, I don't remember any time ever being advised that there was some discourse amongst the agents. I became aware of that when some of the documents were released that I saw. And I want to say it was probably February, early February, something like that of this year. Uh, is that information you would have expected to have received earlier? I would have hoped to have received that earlier, yes, sir. And who would have been responsible for bringing these agents' concerns to your attention? Well, if they had followed the chain of command, I would I'd hope that that information had gotten to me, yes, sir. But, but who, who specifically would have been responsible? I mean, there are people in your chain of command. Can, can you? Uh, if, they had voiced, if they had voiced those specific concerns to their supervisor, I would hope that, uh, and, and they did not get a response that they felt appropriate from their supervisor, then obviously they obviously have the right to go to the, over his or her head, in this case his head, and go to the second line. and then and, so on from there. Well, well, obviously, the committee has the names of the people who are in the, yes. those various lines of command. So Special Agent uh, McMahon, in your interview, you said the same thing, that you didn't hear about these allegations until they were reported in the press. Isn't that right? That is correct. And is that information you would have expected to receive sooner? Did you feel you should have received it sooner? I would have hoped to. If the, if the concerns that were expressed this late on were expressed earlier on, I would hope that if it was, there was so, so much urgency, it, it should have been brought to our attention earlier. The, the line agents testified that they made their concerns known to their group supervisor, uh, David Voth. Uh, yet he, too, told the committee that he knew nothing about their allegations. He said this, quote, I don't recall people coming to me with those concerns, unquote. Now, Mr. McMahon, as the line agent's immediate supervisor, should Mr. Should Mr. Voth have known about the allegations? I am assuming if they were expressed to him, he should have known about them, yes. The, the, the committee has apparently identified a conflict in the testimony. Either the line agents are uh, having difficulty being able to communicate the truth or their supervisor is having that difficulty. Now, um, what steps, Mr. McMahon, did the ATF's management take to ensure that line agents can make headquarters aware of their concerns 
if their direct supervisor is not responsive? And can they do that without, in effect, bringing upon themselves some kind of sanctions for going over the head of a line supervisor? I believe they can. I think the processes that we have set up in ATF headquarters uh, allow that. We have an ombudsman program. We have, obviously, the chain of command anywhere in there. I think uh, our director, every time he has actually been out to uh, visit offices, he has told people about his open door line of communication. He receives emails from line agents. Uh, I have tried to do the same thing on uh, my visits to the field divisions that I uh, oversee. Um, you know, it, you try to make yourself as open as possible to everyone within the bureau. Uh, I, th I thank the gentleman, and I, I just you know want to say we we all appreciate the very difficult and challenging work that every one of the agents here has to uh, carry out. But I'm sure you can understand uh, the questions that have been raised about the conduct of this particular operation. That uh, things don't fit, and when they don't fit, it makes it difficult for members of Congress to be able to uh, uh, defend the kind of support that they want to maintain for, uh, 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 for the Bureau. So I, I want to thank you for being here. Uh, uh, yield back. I want to thank the gentleman from Ohio. Uh, at this point in time, I will uh, give myself uh, five minutes for uh, further questioning. Uh, Mr. Ledman, when, when, when we last left, you were talking about law enforcement partners providing you uh, information in December of 2009 that had given you concern about guns that had actually showed up in, in Mexico. Isn't that correct? Uh, they didn't provide it to me. They provided it to the Phoenix agents, and it was routed to me. So when you say other law enforcement partners, is this partners outside of ATF? Correct. Can you identify what other partners that at this point in time in December of 2009 were part of this investigation? Not, they weren't part, to my knowledge, but they were running a parallel, and it was DEA. Um, I don't want to get into their investigation, even though they, they uh, wrapped up that investigation, I want to say February or so of 2010, but they were Fe Fe February of 2010, but they became part of the OSADEF case. Isn't that right, Mr. Newell and DEA? There were several investigations involving DEA, so that, but what Mr. Ledman is talking about is, is, I believe, the information on that seizure came from, from um, DEA to us, and then it was routed to Mr. Ledman. Came to, to, to you. Mr. Gill, at, at point in time, or Mr. Mr. Canino, while you were in the field doing this, were you aware of any other agencies that had information pertinent to this that you believed was not being shared with you? The only other agency that, uh, under, that we worked with while in Mexico would have been ICE, and we actually used them to a certain extent to conduct interviews uh, either with us or on our behalf regarding arms trafficking. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Clarification. That investigation was not a, uh, originating out of Mexico. That was a U.S. investigation that DEA was doing out of the Phoenix area. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Special Agent, well, I want to go back again to, or, or Special Agent McMahon, uh, you, you, you just responded partially to a question, and unfortunately you weren't allowed to give a full answer, but I was intrigued by what you were beginning to say when, again, there was a, once more a question about the genesis of a case, and you began to talk about agents in the field. You know, the agents were the ones that begin to make these cases. Can you explain to me what you mean by that? Well, the way, way ATF works is our, our agents are the ones that conduct the investigations. They are the ones that generate investigations. Obviously, they should get approval from their first-line supervisor of which investigations to open or not. So what, what, were those agents, what were they investigating, just straw purchasing in general, or were they? No, absolutely. I think w w w when you have a division group, uh, the division usually breaks down those groups into specific, specific types of cases. You might have an arson explosives group. You might have a gang group. You might have a firearms trafficking group. Uh, if you are out in the field where we only have one group, the you agents have working on this case, the, the agents that first this case were working were, on this were, case, were assigned to a gun runner group that okay, was specifically group. assigned to investigate At what point in time did that gun runner Mexico? group take it up higher to the chain where, uh, as part of this? Did they include the assistant United States attorney? Was there an assistant United States attorney appointed to that group? 
I am not sure if it was appointed to that group, but I know we usually try to get an assistant United States attorney onto the case early, as early as possible. How early do you case. think, Mr. Newell, do you recollect that an assistant United States attorney was assigned to this case? From the very beginning, sir. From the very beginning? Yes, sir. Okay. Did that assistant United States attorney, to your knowledge, communicate with the United States attorney about this case? To my knowledge, I, I don't know, sir. Directly. You don't know the answer, but this case began somewhere in November of 2009, and we have testimony that by December of 2009, there was already concern about scores of weapons that were being, being recovered uh, in Mexico. What, what was the response of the uh, Assistant United States Attorney to that, to that revelation? Well, as outlined in the January 8th uh, briefing paper, they felt that there was not enough evidence at that time to um, to secure any warrants or to, uh, or to secure a, a prosecution, so to continue monitoring the sales. Well, they continued monitoring the sales, but, but were they aware and did they believe that guns, ultimately thousands, who were continuing to be trafficked, was this with the approval of the Assistant United States Attorney? Uh, I'm, not exact, I'm not sure what, exactly what they were aware of, sir, but I know they were informed. In the, in the Mr. Gill, at any point in time, did you get a visit from anybody, and who was the highest person that visited you from the Department of Justice with respect to this matter? Uh, to a certain extent, uh, it would have been a DOJ contingent that visited us, uh, I believe, during the summer or spring. And uh, I believe it was Kevin Carwell. Uh, uh, Lanny Brewer visited. Lanny Brewer is the head of the criminal division. Is that not right? At, at the time, I don't know where he is today. But well, well, when did Mr. Brewer visit you in Mexico with respect to this case? We'd have to check the logs to be specific. What's your recollection? But I think it was the summer of two. The summer that would be after we already know that thousands of guns have been trafficked. Yes. Was that communicated to him? By me, no. By anybody to your awareness? No, sir. My time is uh, my time has passed. Um, at this point in time, uh, the chair would recognize uh, the gentlelady, Mrs. Maloney. Well, I, I, I thank you. Uh, I thank you for recognizing me, and I am uh, deeply concerned that uh, while I was on the floor voting, uh, that the chairman, for whom I have tremendous respect, uh, made. Uh, derogatory remarks uh, about uh, uh, Mrs. Norton and myself. And uh, as I hear, I would like to quote what he said, Mrs. Maloney and Ms. Norton, they are radically against the Second Amendment. They absolutely, positively do not want anyone having any guns. They are pretty straightforward about it. They will say they respect the Second Amendment, but they have never seen a gun limitation they do not like. I, I would like to uh, say that um, I support the Second Amendment, and I support legal guns for sportsmen, for law defense, uh, for hunters, for self-defense. Just recently, one of our colleagues, Leonard Boswell, from, was literally someone broke into his home, and he thought his life was in danger. His grandson took a legal registered gun and got the intruder out of the home. I, I respect the right to, to own legal guns for self-defense for other reasons, but I do not support illegal guns that are fueling drug wars and putting lives at risk. In testimony before this committee, uh, the, the, it was told that 40,000 people have died in the last five years on the border of Mexico. And it is uh, uh, what we have put forward is a, a simple statute that would prohibit gun trafficking in illegal guns to people who want to use them for illegal purposes. I, I think that is uh, respecting law enforcement, helping law enforcement, and protecting lives on both sides of the border. And I must also say that uh, the ATF agents who testified and were called by the majority to testify. Uh, they indicated that this would help them do their job and help them to protect innocent people in Mexico and in the United States of America. And I, I just uh, really wanted to clarify that, uh, since I feel that Mrs. Norton and, and uh, myself were attacked unfairly. And uh, 
I, I do not think that a legitimate debate or uh, ideas or legislation uh, should be attacked in this unfair way. So I just uh, would like to clarify that. Would the gentlelady yield? Absolutely. Well, I stand corrected if, uh, if in fact, you are for the Second Amendment, and uh, I will not uh, consider the same with Ms. Norton, who said that my entire side of the aisle was owned by the NRA and some of hers, uh, or somebody in the District of Columbia continues to support basically this being a gun-free zone in violation of the Second Amendment. But I take you at your word, and I am sorry that I exaggerated to include you. The gentleman, the lady yields. Absolutely. Very briefly. Um, I want to thank the Chairman for uh, his apology. Um, but I, I can attest to the fact, Mr. Chairman, that uh, when the gentlelady and I introduced our recent bill, she basically said what she just said, that she had no, no problem. And I think, a lot, I think there's a con if confusion comes in those, those of us who have seen over and over again the result of gun violence, those of us who go to the funerals, those of us who listen to the ATF agents who beg to make sure that we help them because they are fighting weapons of war. Uh, and and that is what we are concerned about. We didn't, they, the ATF agents came in and said, some of them said it today. So I, I, I yield back to the gentlelady and I want to thank the Chairman. I, I just want to also add that I, I think we both agree on both sides of the aisle that, that mistakes were made in the handling of Operation Fast and Furious. And we are uh, legitimately trying to get answers and, and to look at, at this. But the larger issue uh, that I feel is in danger of possibly being overlooked is the flow of illegal weapons. And we are not talking about regular guns. In the testimony from the agents, they call them military-style weapons. They were AK-47s, uh, uh, very special, deadly uh, rifles. So these aren't normal guns. These are, are military guns. And uh, this is an even larger issue than Fast and Furious is to stop the flow of illegal guns. And I believe that on both sides of the aisle we can agree that illegal guns flowing into America or Mexico is something we need to address and stop as quickly as possible. Um, I thank the gentlelady. We now go to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Farenthold, for his round. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I am going to kind of bring the more back to where we were going, I think, with uh, investigating Operation uh, Fast and Furious as opposed to uh, discussing the merits of any proposed new uh, gun regulations or gun laws. Um, well, let me uh, ask the, some of the gentlemen from, uh, from ATF. If, if you remember the lessons we learned from 9-11, we found that we probably would have had a much better chance of stopping the attacks on the World Trade Center had the various organizations within our government been communicating with each other uh, better. Uh, we spent uh, millions of dollars on fusion centers for information sharing among agencies. And then I am troubled to find here that you are basically running an investigation covering some of the same uh, suspects, uh, basically parallel investigations with the Drug Enforcement Administration, and there was an unwillingness to uh, or, or failure to coordinate among those agencies. Would that be a fair assessment of what happened? There were multiple investigations and the DEA didn't know what you were up to and vice versa? Sir, as far as I am concerned, no, it is the complete opposite of that. I think when we, when we received funding to get our gun runner groups up and running, one of the first things we did was assign them to strike force groups so they could work hand in hand with the other agencies. And I think this case is an example of how that was, that was one of the positive things out of this case. DEA had some information that they shared with us that helped us in our investigation and actually helped foster it uh, even more so. Then why, did we, why weren't you all coordinating and there were two different investigations going on? At, at the very least, that seems wasteful of the, uh, of, the, of the taxpayers' money. I don't think, I don't think from what I have seen that there were two different investigations. There was two parallel investigations. Okay. DEA obviously is going to focus on the narcotics. We focus on the firearms. Okay. Well, I have got a couple other questions. I ran out of time last time going off on things that just struck me as odd. Uh, Mr. McMahon, uh, during the pendency of Operation Fast and Furious, did you ever get the chance to uh, go down to uh, Mexico and, uh, and, and uh, visit with any of our folks down in Mexico? 
I did, yes. Did, did you speak to Mr. Canino? I did. I did. And uh, did he raise any concerns about the uh, uh, guns, so many guns tracing back to Phoenix? Not that I recall, no. Mr. Canino, do you, did, did, did you did all discuss that? Do you recall? Yeah, it wasn't anything specific. It was um, it was in passing. Um, like I said earlier, um, you know, when and Mr. McMahon has been very supportive of uh, of our office in Mexico, and me personally. Um, but like I like I stated earlier, when when this when this case was going on, and my and um, when Darren asked me what do you think is going on, like I stated earlier, I thought. The U.S. Attorney's Office in Phoenix is reluctant to let our guys make any arrests. Um, our guys have stumbled onto a drug tra—I mean, a gun trafficking ring. They're doing the due diligence, and that's why so many guns have turned up in the suspect gun database so quickly. And three, I thought that um, our guys were just missing, losing them on surveillance, not being able to get to, get to the gun store in time. That's what I thought at that time. You know, I didn't know that we had cooperators in a couple of the gun stores. Um, so my, our concern, and I just said, hey, how come there's so many guns um, turning and up he, so quickly? And he, and he, he didn't share with you what was going on. Well, he said, hey, you know, we have, we have, a, a, we have a gun trafficking case in Phoenix, and, you know, the guys are doing a good job. All right. Um, Mr. McMahon, uh, did Mr. Gill ever raise concerns over the number of weapons that were uh, being recovered at crime scenes in Mexico? Uh, Congressman, I think it is important to realize that guns were being covered in Mexico for quite a while, and we were all concerned about that. Guns were coming from Phoenix, they were coming from Texas, they were coming from New I mean, that is what we did. That was our main focus in Mexico and obviously along the southwest border. It's, it's for the past four years, it is where all of our resources, our new resources have gone. Uh, this, this guns being recovered in crime scenes in Mexico from the U.S. is something that ATF has been putting everything we have into for the past quite a few years, as long as I have been in headquarters. All right. Well, I, I see I am once again run out of time, and I realize we are getting late, so I will uh, I'll yield back. Thank you very much. Thank the gentleman. You know, as we uh, wind this hearing down, I was just sitting here, I was thinking that, um, you know, this, is, uh, this agency is uh, very important. And we have heard now from two sets of agents, um, and all of whom being, seem, well, I know to be very dedicated to their jobs. Um, and I think one of my greatest concerns uh, as we go forward, Special Agent Newell and McMahon, since you are in supervisory type positions, you know, I, I just hope this does not hurt the morale of the organization. Um, when I look at the emotions of uh, Special Agent Canino and, and, and others, I mean, some kind of way we have got to make sure that uh, we get back on track. I just think it is so important because the job that you do is, what, is only 1,800 of you all? It is not many. That is correct, sir. It is a small agency. And we can't afford to have division in this kind of agency. Would you agree, uh, Special Agent? I, I, I totally agree, sir. That is that's the highest priority for us right now is to get our people back on track. Uh, not a lot of us can have or show passion that Carlos has, but I guarantee you we all have that. We might keep it inside a little bit more than Carlos does, but th this, is, this is a passionate thing for all of us. Uh, yeah, we, we talk about the Second Amendment, and I, I believe that we, ATF, are the defenders of the Second Amendment, and, and we, are, have to keep, we have to follow that very fine line of what's what is part of the legal commerce and what is part of the illegal commerce, and that is part of the challenge, a challenge that we fully accept, and that is something that we were drilled into us from early on when we were in the Academy. It is something we fully accept, and it is something that we do every day. And as I said in my statement, I am very proud of the people that are out there now and have been out there in the past and the work that they are doing.
Now, I'm going to go back to July 12, 2011, uh, letter to the Attorney General. Chairman Issa and Senator Grassley wrote these words. It says, they said, there has been public speculation that gun control politics may have been a motivating factor behind approving the risky strategy used in Operation Fast and Furious. In other words, by allowing straw purchasers to continue to operate and by encouraging gun dealers to go through with what were obviously suspicious sales, the ATL helped to create a big case in order to justify additional regulatory authority. The letter notes that the committee has uh, seen no evidence to support this speculation, but goes on to ask the Department of Justice to respond anyway. Mr. Newell, uh, you were the special agent in charge who oversaw this operation and agents you worked uh, and who worked it uh, for the last year. Uh, what is your reaction to this speculation? When you were engaged in Operation Fast and Furious, I ask you for the record, were you deliberately attempting or do you know others that were deliberately attempting to send guns to Mexico to justify additional firearms regulations? In response to your question, sir, I don't recall saying that that is And I didn't say you did. I am just saying, that do you believe that? No, I don't believe that. Based on everything you know? That, okay, no, that, I don't. Okay. Mr. McMahon? Absolutely not, sir. And did you see any evidence that your line agents acted out of anything but a sincere desire to combat a major trafficking network in this case, Mr. McMahon? Not at all, sir. Not at all, sir. That was, that was their goal, and that was their very dedicated agents out in the field are doing that every day, in this case and many other cases. While it is fair to question the judgment using the case, and I certainly question it, and, I, and, and again, we are trying to get to the bottom of all of this, suggesting a conspiracy to harm others goes beyond the pale. And I think that, you know, I, I just, you know, I, I just, I, I, I just want to make sure that the American people are clear that we have an ATF which uh, is operating and doing what it is supposed to do. Uh, obviously, some mistakes have been made, uh, very unfortunate mistakes. Um, and I think the one thing we have to do is we have to learn from those mistakes and let it, not let them happen again, because they can have very, very, very tragic consequences. And so um, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. And I will try to be brief in a couple of last questions. First of all, I am asked to uh, include some additional uh, uh, documents that were shared and partially redacted with Justice so that we can keep them in the record and potentially ask you questions afterwards. Would all of you be willing to answer additional questions based on what is in the record afterwards if we, if we have follow-ups? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Newell, uh, in, on January 8, 2010, you produced a memo that in line 13 said, currently our strategy is to allow the transfer of firearms to continue to take place, albeit at a much slower pace, in order to further the investigation and allow the identification of additional co-conspirators who would continue to operate illegally trafficking firearms to Mexico DTOs. Now, if I read that correctly, in addition to later where it says DEA has specifically requested that the ASAC and SAC level, that the ATF continue the investigation, if I read this memo of yours correctly, at least by January 10th or January 8th, 2010, you knew that these weapons were going to, specifically weapons that you were allowing to be sold, were going to the drug cartels in Mexico and that you lobbied for in this memo the continuation partially because of DEA's request. Is there anything in plain English that I don't understand here? Yes, sir. As I stated earlier in the testimony, I think that's that, that sentence about who would, that part of the sentence who would, is, who would continue is based on the fact that we believe that if we didn't take the necessary steps to, to disrupt the whole organization, this group would continue to traffic in large quantities of firearms. And, and, and uh, Agent, we are not disagreeing mm -hmm. that these are determined, incredibly rich, billions of dollars of drug money 
groups that have the power to corrupt the Mexican government, at times corrupt U.S. officials, to buy anything they want anywhere in the world in vast quantities. We're not, you know, certainly I don't think anyone on the dais fails to understand that we have a narco state almost being formed in Mexico the way we had in Colombia, and that they and we are fighting to push back on a terrible tragedy that has occurred in Mexico. But the question here is, as of January 8th, I find this document to be irrefutable evidence that you knew that weapons you continue to sell, quote, albeit at a slower pace, although actually the evidence is it didn't slow down right away, but eventually it did, were in fact going to Mexico. You knew it. You knew that when you sold to particularly some of the specific individuals whose weapons had already been found, you knew they were going, that the straw buyer was buying it, you knew who they were transporting it to, who was paying for it, and where it was ending up. Isn't that true as of January 8, 2010? Well, we didn't sell the firearms, sir. You knew, well, you came pretty close. You told the firearm dealer to go ahead and sell it. You knew who the buyer was. You knew there was a repeat buyer. You knew who the intermediary was that was the, the supplier of money, and you knew where they were ending up. Isn't that all true? We believe that, obviously, we were working a firearms trafficking organization that we No, no, wait, wait a second, wait a second. Look, look, we're not talking about what you had to prove to a jury of 12. I'll go over these agents, and they're going to make you look like a fool here if you don't answer this honestly. You knew that A was going to B and B was going to the cartels. You knew that outright, so did the DEA as of January 8th, and that's what this briefing says, doesn't it? Answer me honestly, just once, clearly and simply. Sir, with all due respect, when it comes to the DEA portion of that, it was the fact that DEA had an ongoing investigation from which we gathered the information which led to the initiation of our case. So that, that sentence there discusses the fact that DEA said, hey, whatever you do, don't do anything to compromise our case, which we respected. In, in, in response to your other question is, absolutely, the group that we were working, we knew that that was their intention to funnel guns to Mexico. Wait a second. Intention. Not intention. It was a pattern of success that had occurred for a year. Isn't that true? What? You had watched straw buyers, repeated straw buyers, make purchases, deliver them, and those weapons had shown consistently in the hands of specific cartels, and, as you know, you knew who was paying for them. Isn't that all true? Well, you said a year, sir. When that memo was written in January, it was, we were probably, I would say, two months into the investigation at that point. Let me pass some jurors again. Three months earlier, I apologize. Previous year. Three months. Okay. So three months into this program, about 1,000 weapons or less in, you knew that the weapons you were telling gun dealers to go ahead and sell to the same straw buyers again and again. You already had 20. The number 20 is here. So I'm kind of going, well, you, you've, you've indicted 20, 19 of whom were the straw buyers. So you knew the straw buyers, and the repeats kept coming after you knew starting point bag man or money man, an end point. Isn't that true? Sir, what, we, what we believe and what we suspected is far short of what we could prove. We had to, we were okay. building a case. Okay. Finally, you have given me the answer I wanted. You knew everything you needed to know to understand everything that led to the, the, the uh, charges. What we, you didn't have was enough to make a case. So you went on month after month for 1,500 more weapons while you were trying to make a case. Isn't that correct? Sir, in January, we didn't know all the 20 at that point. The, original, the 20 that we indicted, we had a, gr a large group of straw purchasers, uh, and we were continuing to build a case throughout. But we still, in con full conjunction with the U.S. Attorney's Office, we still needed the evidence to be able to prove that these individuals were, in fact, involved. Who at the U.S. Attorney's Office wanted this investigation to go on past, past January 8, 2010? When, when did the Who? Who? Did Lanny Brewer, was he briefed by January 8, 2010? I don't know if he was, sir. Well, his office approved the wiretaps um, with, under his authority. Did you, you said you didn't read the wiretaps. I guess neither one of you read the, uh, uh, the requirements. But somebody had to be briefed who signed it on his behalf, on his authority. Did either of you ever brief Lanny Brewer or anyone else that could sign on his behalf? I did not know, sir. I did not know. Okay. So I guess we are just going to figure that you knew on January 8th that you had 
the same people buying weapons repeatedly, leading to the same cartel, and you didn't quit because you hadn't made your case, so we continued selling until we had a dead Federal agent and a scandal. That's pretty much what I've heard here today. Any of the agents that work in the field, any of you see something different than this thing kept going after the everything was known except maybe if we keep doing long enough, we'll get better cases for the U.S. Attorney, and then it, it, fell, it began falling apart after Brian Terry was murdered. Does anyone in the first four see anything different? Correct me if I've missed something. Chairman, I'm still sitting here listening to, to, to the conversation, and it's still unbelievable to me. And I, to be honest, quite honest with you, I still don't know what to believe uh, why this investigation was initiated and why it, why it continued for so long. I can't. Uh, I know you look speechless. I'm speechless. I just don't know. Well, uh, words escape me to try to uh, do any better than you don't know why, and I don't know why either. The gentlelady from New York, uh, additional round. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to follow up on the line of a uh, question of uh, Congressman Farenholt when he was talking about the lack of communication, which after 9-11 we had many commissions, we had many studies, and what came out of these commissions was that, that we weren't, our intelligence wasn't working and uh, we weren't communicating. And we then overhauled our government, the most major overhaul of our intelligence since 1948. And uh, it seems to be a little bit of the same thing of what I'm hearing about the, these hearings, because people are saying they didn't know anything, and people are saying they told people, and it's not getting through. So the communication is not taking place. When you mention 9-11, the mayor of New York, and we are about to come upon the 10th anniversary of that tragic day, has been airing TV ads in New York where they use the words of an al-Qaeda leader who is talking to his followers and saying, go to America. It's so easy to get a gun. Go to America. Get all the guns you need in our fight uh, for the al-Qaeda. So this is an ad about how illegal people who want to hurt Americans are being instructed, literally, to, to come to America and get guns in order to uh, combat um, democracies. And uh, so I think this hearing is very, very serious about the, the flow of, of, of illegal guns. Earlier, we had a hearing, and we had several agents who seemed very brave, very frustrated, and very courageous. And, and they testified that they were concerned about the sale of the guns to straw agents. They were concerned about not having arrests about being ordered not to make arrests and not to conduct surveillance. And I understand that you were asked, Mr. Newell and Mr. McMahon, and you did not hear any of their frustrations. Uh, they testified that they reported this to their supervisors, and nothing happened, and that's why they were so frustrated. So I think we've got to figure out what happens when someone reports something they feel is illegal, wrong, dangerous, or harmful to lives. And, and uh, I'm, I'm not just talking about what happened in Fast and Furious. I'm talking about going forward. Agents on the ground who think that someone should be arrested and they're being told not to make an arrest or when they're being told not to make a surveillance and a su supervisor says don't do it and they're saying we should do it and they're complaining to someone else, that information has got to go up the line in order to have proper law enforcement and proper protection for our, our citizens. Uh, so, so I um, ask anyone on the panel to comment, but I see this as a very serious, a very serious blockade or a very serious problem if people who feel something wrong and harmful to the safety of Americans or Mexicans is taking place, then uh, someone should be listening. And if, if, the, if the chain of command is not listening, uh, maybe there should be an alternative chain of command put in place or, or something, because this type of concern has got to get to the proper authorities in order to make uh, proper decisions to make arrests, continue the surveillance, and, and do the proper things to stop illegal activity. So I just uh, would ask any of you to comment on what we've been hearing, 
people say they asked for help, and, and other people say they never heard anything. So what's going on? Is there some, you know, uh, black hole that complaints fall into? What, what is the chain of command? Why did not the complaints or concerns of the on-the-line defenders of, of justice, why didn't their concerns about what they thought was illegal and dangerous get to the proper authorities? I, I, I could take that if I could. Uh, that is a concern, a, a major concern. I th ATF is my family. And, and obviously when I hear agents criticize things that were happening in the street, and, and obviously there was a communication breakdown, that, 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 that's very concerning to me. I, I, one of the things I wrote down here, the things that I would like to improve on is my access to people in the field maybe even just sitting down, hey, what can you tell me? What's going on? That, that sort of thing. I'm actually going to be going into a new position soon that's going to be talking about, uh, be overseeing the review of our office and the effectiveness well, and efficiency. Well, what happened now? Are you conducting an investigation to find out why the information from, from the agents on the street didn't get to the proper authorities? Well, I believe the Inspector General is, is conducting that investigation, and we look forward to the results of that. And when do you expect that to come back? I, I, don't, I don't know. Okay, thank you. Thank the gentlelady. I'll recognize myself for another round. Uh, I'm going to go down the row, as we often do here, and just pose a single question for each, each of you to uh, answer. Uh, Special Agent Newell answered it already. If it was January 9th, you had just written that briefing. You knew what Special Agent knew and uh, Special Agent McMahon knew about what had happened, what was happening. You knew about the, the uh, DEA's request, but you also knew about where these guns were ending up. Mr. Gill, start with you. If we put you in charge of the Phoenix field office on that day, what would you do? Uh, Mr. Chairman, that, that investigation would have been closed, uh, come to a conclusion. In 30, 60, 90 days? No, sir, uh, immediately. It, it, these, these, that part of an investigation on a trafficking is it's not you, know, you have the trafficker, you have them there, you have the probable cause, you have the intelligence, you have everything you need to make the arrest. And as they were, the discussion occurred earlier, the other tools in the toolbox are there, interviews, phone records, interviews of uh, cohorts and so forth. It, it, investigation, you know, with these guns, they're, they're, a, uh, they're not a, a disposable product. These weapons, you know, they're going to be out there for years, decades. And uh, they're a durable good. They're a marketable item. And that's why, historically, ATF, my career, uh, my training officer educated us on us, as I trained my young agents on, it just, it's inconceivable that you would let weapons walk. Agent Wall. Same thing, uh, Chairman. Uh, letting one gun walk is a huge risk. Uh, again, a gun can last 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, a, a gun in the hands of criminals, uh, it's a, uh, virtually, it's um, a loaded weapon that, that, that's out there that's uncontrollable. Uh, we in ATF typically, I, I, I just, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm dumbfounded by, by the, just the number of weapons and how it got to that point and really just uh, supporting what uh, Mr. Gill said. Agent Canino. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As you know, we've met now a couple of times. You can see I'm kind of passionate about what I do. Um, I don't want to give you the impression or the ranking member or the committee the impression that um, I never made mistakes. I was a street agent for 15 years, very active street agent. Anybody who knows me knows my reputation. They know I've made mistakes. Um, you know, I respect Bill and Bill. I consider them friends. Uh, I know it's not easy for them to be here today, um, but uh, hopefully um, this won't happen again. And hopefully, when the committee finally issues their report, um, our agency will be the better for it, and we can move on down the line. Um, I agree. I think the first order of business for our agency right now is to build the morale close ranks and, and move forward and support each other. Thank you. Mr. Ledman. Yes, sir. Uh, I would like to expand and say that I think uh, Congressman Maloney kind of touched on what the 
underlying problem is for our agency in these major investigations. She talked about 9 and 11, the lessons we learned, the lack of the sharing of information, the intel. Well, from my perspective as a, in my law enforcement career involved in major case investigations in the District of Columbia, I learned some things with my task forcing with other agencies, FBI, DEA, and ATF. And one of the things that I see in ATF that we are lacking, we are lacking on the intel-led investigative side of the House. Our intel structure within the uh, ATF is very limited. Our field figs uh, need resources. Our headquarters entities need in, uh, resources also. Now, to put this in perspective, ATF now, with the uh, battle that Calderon is waging against the drug cartels in Mexico, we need to meet that challenge. And that challenge is, as they are going out and they are taking off these guns and these seizure events, we have to stop the flow because they can't win if they keep getting replenished. So with that in mind, we have to start taking uh, some of the uh, best practices of our other agencies, and i.e., under an intel-led investigation. I am not just talking about single investigations. In ATF, we have silo systems. We have divisions that work out of their divisions. Everything comes out of the division. This has to stop. This has, there has to be headquarters, not oversight, get all in their business type thing. But this has got to do like our other agencies are, that, that exchanges the information freely, partners up with outside agencies at all levels, not just in the di divisions, but all the way up into headquarters. And to do that, we have to build a structure an intelligence structure to support not only our agents in the field, but our, our partners in Mexico and our other Federal agencies. Well, I'm, not, I'm going to cut you off only because of time limitations. We have a subcommittee okay. coming in in a short time. But uh, first of all, you are singing, I think, on a bipartisan basis to the, what we need to do. And we probably will have you back as we get into the, the corrective phase, the reorganization, if appropriate. Let me just ask one closing question. Uh, Jaime Avila, uh, uh, Panino, uh, Pen, Pen, Patino, I'm sorry, uh, Chambers and Stewart, they're all on the street today. They have not been convicted of a crime as straw buyers. If they walked into a gun shop today, just because they've been arrested, does that mean they can't buy? Would they be able to buy a weapon today? Uh, they wouldn't be able to buy the weapon because they are under indictment. Uh, but I am not sure if the NICS system in Phoenix would capture that if they did attempt to buy the weapon. So today you know that they shouldn't be able to buy, they shouldn't be on the street, but 20 straw buyers are on the street, and you are not sure if all 20 are in fact presently in the system where any federally licensed uh, gun store would stop them immediately. Is that correct? Well, that's not our system, sir. The NICS system is, is, is run by another agency. No, I understand and that. But you, right now, you don't, you, don't have, you don't have full confidence that these people are not out doing straw purchases again. No, sir. They were, they were granted bail, as, as everyone is entitled to. They are also granted a speedy trial that I understand is delayed at least until February of next year, so they continue to be out there. That's correct. The trial was scheduled for June, and then it has been postponed until February. Okay. Uh, with that, I'm afraid we have to adjourn. I thank you all. Mr. Chairman, a point of personal privilege. Yes, point of personal privilege. Yes. I, since my position was mischaracter mischaracterized in, in this hearing, I have come back to state my uh, true position, and I wonder if I may be given a few minutes to do that. Uh, if you want to state your true position, bearing in mind that you told us that all of us on this side of the aisle were, were owned by the NRA. I could, if, I could, if I could, we heard from you, if, if I could state my position. I was here for some time, Mr. Chairman, and I note the note that I didn't, I didn't hear anyone um, speak up then. I can understand that. Um, Actually, the gentlelady left before. Yeah, I was, uh, here, we, I was here for about 15 or 20 minutes. But I, it's, it's the right of any member uh, to speak up. And uh, I can only be grateful, Mr. Chairman, that you didn't say that I was vile or or, or words of the kind that were uttered when uh, another member um, was, uh, was uh, outraged that in, in his absence his position was uh, uh, characterized. Uh, yes, uh, as I heard pontificating uh, before law enforcement officers who risked their lives, uh, I was moved uh, to indicate 
that we had not given ATF agents the tools that they deserved. Uh, and indeed, I indicated uh, that the, the issues spread even into our, our cities. Uh, as for the District of Columbia, laws which apparently were raised, uh, the District of Columbia barred guns uh, in light of carnage uh, over the decades. Those laws had been found to be constitutional. And for decades, every appellate court had so found for the district's laws and for the laws of other states until an activist and much more conservative Supreme Court overturned the findings of prior Supreme Courts for the first time. The District of Columbia proceeded to obey the new law and enacted a set of gun laws which have since been found constitutional. And yet, members of this body have filed bills seeking to overturn the laws of a local jurisdiction, not their own, simply because they disagree with the way they approach gun control. You can approach gun control anywhere you like in Arizona or California, but you are not at liberty to tell the people of the District of Columbia who have to live with the carnage how to approach it, particularly when the laws have been declared uh, constitutional. Uh, yes, I stand by the notion that the reason that the ATF agents don't have the laws they need is because uh, the Republicans have over and over again introduced laws that would, in fact, keep them from uh, getting those laws and have stood in the way of their, uh, uh, of, of, of their acquiring those laws. And I have been bipartisan because there have been some in my own party who have stood with them. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, having taken the agents uh, 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 to um, the woodshed, it does seem to me that in the Congress they are entitled to something from us. So I would like to ask you, in light of the fact that they have all testified that they could, that they need more tools in order to do their job, whether you would co-sponsor the bill that has been introduced that would, in fact, give them a trafficking tool so that this would not happen again to them or to us. And would you be willing to sponsor that bill, Mr. Chairman? No, ma'am. Enough said. And with that, gentlemen, you bear witness to the other side of the aisle at work. With that, we stand adjourned.